We're back for your ears only. I'm Melissa Axelberth. I'm David Alpern with this quote from the news. Hard to save lives if we and other health workers cannot get in. That was a Twitter message from the World Health Organization after Korean Airlines suspended flights to Kenya, a major gateway to Ebola-plagued Liberia, Nigeria, Guinea, and Sierra Leone. The Ebola death toll there passed 1,100 as the small supply of one untested treatment for the disease was demanded and finally delivered. Now this. Little boxes on the hillside, little boxes made of ticky-tacky, little boxes on the hillside, little boxes all the same. A house is a very, very, very fine house with two cats in the yard. Life used to be so hard, now everything is easy because of you. Malvina Reynolds' classic critique of suburbia and the great group Crosby, Stills, Nash, and Young with a different view of home. The houses we live in say different things about us to different people. So do the buildings we work in, play in, pray in, and archive the best of our literature and art. Pulitzer Prize-winning novelist and social critic Alison Lurie considers the many aspects of architecture in her book, The Language of Houses, How Buildings Speak to Us, new this week from Delphinium Publishers. And to speak about it for your ears only, Alison Lurie is on the line now. Welcome to the program. Thank you for having me. Before this book, you wrote The Language of Clothes, about how what we wear has changed through the ages and what our choice of apparel says about us at any particular moment in history. Are the buildings we design and construct as revealing of who we are or want to be? Well, not always. Most buildings are collaborations or compromises, developers versus zoning boards. Uh, At home, if you live alone, yes, it's just as revealing. But if you live with somebody else, uh, you've got to compromise there, too. Uh, it's a compromise between, say, your husband's love of sports trophies and memorabilia and your love of paintings of flowers and landscapes. So uh, it's uh, not as uh, single-minded as, as what somebody's wearing. Talk about some of the things a house can say about us. Do big windows say we love what we see out of them or long to be seen through them? Well, I think it can be both. In an apartment high-rise, everything is all view, and people aren't thinking of of showing themselves but of looking at what's around them. Although I've learned through my research that that sometimes they're wrong because a lot of apartment dwellers keep a pair of binoculars on the (laughs) shelf under the window, and one of the things they do when they're bored is look at the other high-rise buildings. <laughs> what about houses that are symmetrical, door in the middle, same number of windows on each side versus those that are not? My wife and I had a one-story ranch house to which we added a two-story addition on one side. Will people uh, passing by suspect we're unbalanced? Absolutely not. We only really expect that kind of symmetry uh, from public buildings. Uh, and we only expect it even with public buildings in the front. Sometimes if you go around the back of a big town hall, you'll find it's just as uneven as your your or my backyard. A few buildings are symmetrical both front and back, like the United States Capitol, but it's rare. I've seen pillows that say my other house is neater. Do people with two homes, a weekend or a vacation place, generally keep them up differently? I think they do. After all, in a vacation house, nobody's going to see it except your children and their friends and and your own best friends. So you can be more relaxed. Uh, You don't have to worry uh, about uh, whether everything is absolutely clean, absolutely tidy, absolutely new. Let's talk about public buildings, starting with museums and libraries, temples of learning and culture, but not always built like temples anymore. Uh, The newly relocated Parish Museum in Southampton looks like one of the local horse barns pumped up on steroids. Do you think we lose something by forsaking old-fashioned grandeur, or at least some indication of the treasures we value inside a museum? I think it depends a lot on what sort of art is inside the building. Uh, The elaborate... 19th century buildings that we used to go to to see famous uh, artists of the past, like the Metropolitan Museum, uh, they're right for these paintings. Um, 
the Southampton Museum probably has mostly modern art in it. And if they do have, let us say, by accident, the uh, Rembrandt or Turner of a very rich local resident, it's going to look small and sad in an airplane hangar-type building. What can you say about actual temples, churches, synagogues, mosques, how their designs vary from religion to religion and over the ages? Well, uh, I think you can tell very much about a religion from the way its meeting place looks. I mean, I, mean, I don't know if you've ever been into a, a Quaker meeting house, but there's nothing in it except rows of benches arranged around a, a central space. Uh, for them... God is a, a spiritual presence, but not so much a physical presence. Uh, whereas if you go into the European Baroque Catholic Church, it's all plaster angels and images of saints it's, and a huge gold organ. So it's a different idea of what heaven is like, uh, what God is like, and it's very visible at extremes like this. And what about commercial establishments, shopping environments that scream save when they mean spend? Oh, they all do that. Even the the most polite uh, local uh, uh, craft shop in in Southampton is is telling us that uh, there are bargains here. You'll feel better when you buy these things. Um, uh, They don't no one's going to put up a sign say spend money because uh, it'll make us react against it. Pulitzer Prize-winning novelist and social critic Alison Lurie considers the many aspects of architecture in her book, The Language of Houses, How Buildings Speak to Us, new this week from Delphinium. I'll light the fire While you place the flowers In the vase that you bought Today. Quote from the news, don't do stupid stuff is not an organizing principle. That was Hillary Clinton on President Obama's foreign policy in an Atlantic magazine interview. She later called the White House to patch up relations, and she said she looked forward to hugging it out when they met at a party on Martha's Vineyard. No photos of hugging emerged, but a good time seemed to be had by all. Next, to encourage daring women, author Gail Sheehy, for your ears only.